tonight I, I, I would like to begin uh, first by introducing myself and my organization, then I will talk about the Triangle Fire and make connections. The, the thing that makes the Triangle Fire so compelling, obviously, is that it is uh, a history that still speaks to us uh, today, and that's, that's uh, why people still come to hear about it, and people come every year to remember it, um, and, and it, it's terrible that it happened. But it's really great that, that we do remember it. And it is one of the things of uh, one of the moments or episodes in US labor history that labor history is largely forgotten in the US. But the triangle, uh, for, for different reasons, and we can talk about that if you, if you mm -hmm. like, is one of the most remembered. Um, and that's the name of our organization, Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Um, we are a nonprofit history, public history, public memory, uh, arts activist organization that was founded in 2008 with two major objectives. Uh, the first is really twofold, to bring together a broad and diverse group of organizations and individuals to commemorate the centennial of the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. So the fire happened on March 25th, 1911. So we ramped up from 2008 uh, to 2011, and as Steve knows and anybody here knows who's an organizer, things do not happen overnight. You need a lot of time to ramp up. So we, uh, we worked uh, diligently to uh, bring people together from all over the US. There were, there were commemorations in San Francisco. Um, there were commemorations in, in Europe, commemorations certainly in, in New York, uh, Chicago, all over. Um, and we continue to work with unions and educational uh, organizations and um, OSHA to commemorate the fire every year, uh, and we'll do that. Uh, the fire has been commemorated annually by the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which is now Workers United, since the 50th anniversary. Um, when Eleanor Roosevelt was there and Francis Perkins. Um, it was commemorated rather sporadically and kind of by, you know, ad hoc groups, but ever since the 50th anniversary, um, there's been an annual commemoration and we will, we will keep that going, we hope, um, in, in perpetuity. And the second thing that we do, um, and along with the commemoration, of course, we do lots of educational events. I mean, March is like, the, like I'm, it's like an accountant during tax season for us. But, but we do this kind of educational work year round, and that's partly why I'm here. And the second goal that we have, um, that I will talk to you a little bit about more um, at, toward the end of the presentation, is to create a permanent memorial, uh, which will be installed on the building uh, where the fire happened. And we'll talk a little bit more about why, you know, when there's so much that needs to be done, why are we uh, building uh, an art memorial on a building? Um, and there are really important reasons, I think, and I hope, I hope you will agree. Um, so first, let me start by giving you an account of the fire. Um, so is anybody here who'd never heard of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of those things, even people who don't know what it is. Um, the, uh, so, so the Triangle. Oh, you did? Oh, OK. So what brought you here, then? Just curious to know? Okay, great. Well, we'll change that, right? <laughs> All right, so the, the, um, the Triangle Waste Company was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of the Ash Building, uh, which is one block east of Washington Square Park in, in New York. Um, it's now the Brown Building, and it belongs to New York University. The Triangle owners, um, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, were successful makers of women's blouses. That's what a shirtwaist is, if you think of a fancy woman's blouse. Um, they were actually known as the shirtwaist kings. Um, they had about 500 employees. We're really not sure how many they had. They're not, they weren't sure how many they had. Uh, but we think there were about 500 employees. Most of them were young women, and, and they were I mean, young women were, were employed in great numbers in the needle trades in New York. And New York was a center of garment manufacturing at the time. Um, the, the, a major percentage of women's clothing in the United States in that, in that era, in that decade, was manufactured in New York City um, by women. Most of them were young women. Most of them were recent immigrants, primarily Italians and Jews. And some of the uh, Italians, for example, had been in the US less than a year. So they were. Um, really, really recent immigrants. Um, Saturday, March 25th, 1911, at just before closing time, a fire broke out on the eighth floor of the building. So the top three floors, uh, the top floor is the 10th, then the ninth, and then the eighth. You could see, um, you could tell uh, where the fire was. Um, now, it was not 
unusual for workers to be working on a Saturday. Uh, the interesting thing about Triangle, too, is that so many of the workers were Jewish, and this was the Sabbath. And for many of them, it was a violation of, of their religious uh, code to work on the Sabbath, and they really had no choice because they were told, if you don't come to work today, don't come back. So they were, in addition to, to you know, having minimal leisure time, they, they were forced into breaking the Sabbath. Um, oop. Okay, I'll just keep, bear with me. Um, so the Triangle Factory had minimal safety precautions. Uh, Blank and Harris were interested in making money. They were not unusual um, factory owners at the time. They weren't interested in human safety and well-being. So, and they subcontracted the work, right? So they paid somebody to hire people, um, and that person or those people, that entity that was responsible for hiring workers, then the, the lower the wages for the workers, the greater the profits for them, right? And so that's why Blank and Harris really didn't even know who, how many people they had working for them because it was, it, they, this was all subcontracted and that was, that was not unusual um, in the garment uh, industry in New York City. So the individuals hired workers, paid them as little as possible and pocketed as whatever money was left over. So Blank and Harris had no idea how many people worked for them or, in fact, how much their workers were actually paid. And they didn't care. And again, they were not unusual. Um, they got insurance to cover their capital investments, the machinery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they did not spend money to protect their workers. Uh, and, and if you, you know, if we, we, we're debating all the time about the, the benefits, the costs and benefits of regulation of industry, this is what no regulation looks like, right? Um, so the building itself was fireproof, um, but the, 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 the contents were not, right? And what was the safety situation like? Uh, there were no sprinklers. There were 27 buckets of water. The doors to the factory opened inward. Fire escapes were defective. Um, and the factory was packed with machinery and workers to maximize the amount of profits that could be squeezed out of the space. So you fit as many machines and as many people in there as possible so that you can make as, most, as much money per square inch as possible. Um, and of course, the, the, the room is filled with um, uh, fabric, fibers in the air, scraps of cloth in the bins, and all of that uh, has implications for what happens. Um, so you might ask yourself, well, why didn't the unions do something? Why, why were these safety conditions so lax? Why, and, the, and Triangle was a state-of-the-art building, right? This was a fireproof building. Um, this was a building because the building had two exits, and it should have had three. But the builders, when they built the building, made the argument that although the, the amount of square footage in the building required three exits by law. The, um, the, the, it was high and not wide, so they didn't need the third exit, right? So they, they kind of used a loophole. Um, so why didn't the union do something about it? Um, the I International Ladies Garment Workers Union represented many in the needle trades, in the, in the industry in, in New York City. But Triangle was not a union shop. Um, workers tried to unionize. Uh, in 1909, an incident at the Triangle factory sparked a walkout and a picket. Um, and the workers, the women, were treated uh, actually very badly. Um, and the Women's Trade Union League, which was an organization that was set up to, as a kind of liaison between middle class women and working women, they actually stepped in and helped the, the the women at Triangle, and then later the women who, who went on strike and the general strike in the industry, known as the uprising of the 20,000, uh, to fend off uh, violence. Um, and why would women who were picketing be subject to violence? Um, in part, it was, of course, class antagonism, right? But it, in part, it was also because women out in public on a picket line uh, in the streets was a social taboo. Um, you, you, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard the expression streetwalker, right, for, for women, for prostitutes. Um, why streetwalker, you might ask yourself. Well, the whole idea is a woman parading her body in the streets, walking around in the streets, letting it be known that her body is how she makes her money is, is taboo. So strikers were um, compared to streetwalkers. Right? Here they are, out on the streets, unescorted women, advertising that they work with their bodies. 
Now, granted, it's a different kind of work, but it is nonetheless, you know, I earn my bread with my body, I'm out on the street. So they were compared to prostitutes and they were treated um, quite badly uh, by the police. So um, that initial walkout at the Triangle um, is kind of the first uh, bubble in what ultimately became known as uh, the uprising of, of the 20,000, right? That, that unrest in the industry, um, the, the drive for better working conditions, <laughs> better hours, and better wages culminated in a strike um, of mostly Jewish uh, women in the industry known as the uprising of the 20,000. And it began with a dramatic flourish um, at the Great Hall at Cooper Union in New York City. Uh, there was a debate amongst the, the union leaders and the workers, what should we do, what should we do, what should we do? And a young woman, 19 years old, Clara Lemlich, um, kept trying to speak and was, was not able, um, was not given the podium, was not able to secure uh, a, an audience for her voice. And then finally she got just frustrated and rushed up to the podium and said, I've got something to say. And she stood at the podium and, and said, look, we could debate this all night, but the bottom line is we need to strike. And so, you know, the hall erupted and there were calls for the strike and Clara Lemlick, may my right hand wither off if I break this vow and they stormed out and, and, and that was the beginning, the very dramatic beginning of the uprising of the 20,000. Um, and they, you know, they banded together to, Clara Lemlick, I think, got her ribs broken six times in the course of that strike. I mean, when I say that they, they were treated badly, I'm not... That's not hyperbole, right? In fact, I'm understating how badly they were treated. In fact, when the girls were arrested, the pickets were arrested and thrown into prison, prostitutes who were also in prison with them said, wow, you guys are getting treated worse than we do, and your working conditions are worse. We actually make better money than you do, and we don't get treated as poorly um, as you do. So not only were they facing harsh conditions on the job, but they were facing harsh conditions when they tried to agitate for better conditions on the job. Uh, so, um, Excuse me, when you say girls, are we talking about under 18 years old? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, we are. Absolutely. And we will, you'll, you'll see what I mean in, in, in a minute. Um, so in 1910, a historic agreement was reached between manufacturers and, and the union. Um, it established a grievance process. Many of the factories were unionized. Safety conditions were improved. Triangle was not among them. The Black, Blank and Harris held out, and, and they refused to settle. And the girls, needing money, obviously, um, went back to work. Um, so what caused the fire? Um, it was probably a cigarette. Right? This is what it looked like when the fire was over um, on the ninth floor. Uh, it was probably a cigarette. It is likely that a cutter was smoking um, and his ash fell into the bin and then it lit the scraps of fabric and then um, the, the, the fibers in the air, the air itself, according to you know, the, the, the survivors of the fire, the air itself was on fire, right? It just lit up in front of them. Um, so that because the building was fireproof, nothing else was, you see what happened. I mean, this is, this is what was left. I mean, actually, the coalition we, we have now is one of our, our stalwart supporters, um, a gentleman who, who lives in Massachusetts, uh, Martin Abramowitz, who is the son of Israel Abramowitz, who is almost certainly the cutter who started the fire. Um, it was his bin into which the ash fell, and, 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 and is almost certain the way he's, his dad and, the, and mom talked about it, um, or actually his dad didn't talk about it, um, that he probably started the fire. So he lived with that for the rest of his life, as did, as did his family. Um, so workers tried to put the fire out, but the buckets of water were not enough. And when they turned on the hoses, nothing came out. So the fire burned on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors. And people did escape. Okay? Uh, the 8th floor called up to the 10th floor, because the workers on the 8th floor were the first to, to notice the fire. They called up to the 10th floor where the switchboard operator was. Um, and uh, the switchboard operator on the 10th floor notified uh, uh, people on the 10th floor, which was primarily the management um, and, and some other workers. But so the management, their children, the children of Blank and Harris, um, and, and others on the 10th floor um, got to safety. They went across the roof. Actually, they were ferried across the roof onto the roof of the building next door by NYU law students. Workers on the eighth floor went down. Um, you know, they went down the stairway that was available. They went down in the, in the elevator. 
Um, the ninth floor workers were not so fortunate. What happened is the woman on the 10th floor who was uh, working the switchboard that day, she was supposed to put a call down onto the ninth floor. But her dad was somewhere on the 10th floor. And so she was, she, I think it was her dad. I think it was her dad. It was a male, a close male family member. And she went to help him. And then as you might, I mean, it's hard to fault her. She was so concerned for his safety that she never went back to the switchboard. So the call went up to the 10th floor, but it never got to the 9th floor. So they never knew. Um, so while everybody's rushing out, they're working. And you know the machines are really loud. So they didn't hear any commotion. So when they did find out, um, they rushed to the doors. Um, but if you remember what I said, the doors rushed inward. So imagine, you know, people in a panic packing in front of doors. You have to actually step back to get out. And they didn't have the, the wherewithal uh, to do that. Many scrambled into the elevator, which held uh, 15 people, but 30, 30 girls piled in at, at a time. Uh, some of them held on to the cable and um, jumped down the shaft. Um, they held on and, and uh, you know, their hands were bleeding. Um, they would fall down on bodies on top of bodies, um, and they kept doing that until the, the cable of the elevator uh, broke. Um, some ran down the fire escape, but it was not, um, it would have taken them out and out, I think it's almost two hours to run down the fire escape, right? And so they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have survived anyway, um, but the fire escape was, was not, I mean, there were no standards um, for fire escapes, and so it collapsed um, under their weight, and at least one of the, um, of the women who tried to get down was impaled um, by a metal uh, spike. Um, so fire trucks rushed to the scene almost immediately, right? I mean, the fire department was there almost immediately, but um, this is a, obviously not an historic photo, but the ladder, New York City fire codes uh, mandated that ladders reach up to the sixth floor. Um, and so the fire, these girls were on the ninth floor. So every year at the commemoration, we raise the ladder to the sixth floor. It's really moving. The, the, you know, there's speeches and stuff at the beginning, and some are better than others. But then there's a moment where we have a moment of silence. We raise, we raise the ladder. The fire department brings the truck. We raise the ladder to the sixth floor. And they do. I'm sorry. We have a moment of silence. And you can't help but cry because you see the distance between where they needed the ladder and where the ladder could reach. So people looked on in horror. Uh, firemen rushed to grab nets. And the girls um, started jumping out, those who were not burned uh, alive inside. Or you, you don't burn usually. You, I mean, you do burn, but, but you die of smoke inhalation first. Um, at least 50 of the girls jumped out the windows, and they, they jumped towards the nets, and the nets just ripped apart. And so they, they literally, my students use, overuse this word all the time, but here it's warranted, they literally smashed through the pavement. I mean, there, there are photos of the holes in the pavement, um, because the, the way the, the building was, there, the pavement, there was sort of hollows in front of the building. It was paved over, but it wasn't like solid, and they crashed right through the pavement. Um, yeah. Um, the factory was near Washington Square Park. And any of you who've ever been to New York City, Washington Square Park is um, it's bordered by some really nice houses. And they were nice in 1911. It was a very comfortable middle class neighborhood um, that bordered the park. And people would gather in the park all the time. This was a, a warm early spring evening. There were lots of people outside. And they watched in horror from Washington Square Park. It was not unusual to watch fires, by the way, from Washington Square Park. There are records, you know, I've been doing some research on this. There are records of fires. This one was different, of course. I mean, this was, this was uh, awful. Uh, so people watched in horror. You can see right here bodies uh, on the pavement below, people looking up. Um, and that was, you know, that's what you did. You looked up, you looked down, you looked up, uh, you looked down. And for many people, particularly middle class residents of New York City, this is the first time they saw the reality of factory life, of working class life in the United States. They walked past this building all the time and had no idea what was going on inside. And what happened on March 25th, 1911, is <laughs> exploited labor was made visible for every, it was absolutely impossible to ignore it, right? Here it was right in front of you, falling from the sky almost. Um, 146 people were killed in the fire. Uh, 50, at least 50, jumped to their deaths uh, right in front of people. 
um, thud dead, right? That's the William Gunn Shepherd reported. Uh, he was an eyewitness. William Gunn Shepherd was a young reporter. He called um, his editor and, and reported at what he saw in front of him. And there's, there's, a, there's a very um, almost poetic account of a young man who helped uh, what, what was possibly you know, his love interest. And he held his hand out to her and then let her go uh, like a gentleman down. And then he himself jumped. Um, people reported thinking they were umbrellas that were falling out of the building. And then they got closer and realized to their horror they were girls and women. Um, and the sound that was reported by, by William Gunn Shepherd was thud dead. Thud dead because you heard them uh, hit hit the pa pavement. Uh, 129 of the 146 were women, mostly Italian and Jewish immigrants, um, and some were teenagers. The youngest was 14 years old. There were at least two 14-year-olds. Um, uh, Rosaria Maltese was uh, one uh, of the 14-year-olds. There actually is a, a, a plaque that was recently installed in a piazza in in uh, Sicily, I believe, uh, to commemorate. Uh, her life and, and mark that she died um, in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. The bodies uh, were taken to a covered pier on 26th Street um, for identification. And, and the, it's heartbreaking. I think one of the best accounts, I think probably the best account of the fire is Leon Stein's <coughs> Triangle Fire. Um, Leon Stein uh, was with the ILGWU, who's the editor of their, of, the, of their newspaper. And he did the real groundbreaking work, interviewing people, going through the records. Um, and he talks about the way bodies were identified. You know, shoes, um, rosary beads, uh, a scrap of cloth. Um, you know, some of the girls fell holding their wages. They dropped their wages. It was payday. Uh, and so they were identified with, because with, uh, when bodies are charred, it's hard to, to recognize them. So they, they were identified by any means uh, possible. And six of them remained unidentified. And their identities were revealed in 2011 by, by Michael Hirsch. Um, and, and their names are all the definitive list of the, of the victims of the fire is on the website of the Kiel Center, K-H-E-E-L, at Cornell University. They have a, have a whole website devoted to um, the Triangle uh, Shirtwaist Factory fire. And it's actually quite, quite good. Um, so the fire lasted um, about half an hour from start to finish. Um, I mean, the fire itself was brief, was I mean, under 15 minutes, but the whole, you know, by the time they put it out, it was, it was half an hour. But its effects are still being felt today, even in this room, um, and, and we'll get to that. So the first effect, of course, was grief. New Yorkers were shocked, stunned. The families of the victims, absolutely, but, but New Yorkers generally. And they asked themselves, who's responsible for this? Who, who's responsible? Is it, is it the factory owners? Is it politicians? Is it the fire department? Is it everybody? Nobody? And everybody in New York City was struggling to, to blame everybody else. Right? Well, we're not responsible for that. Well, we're not responsible for that. Well, we didn't know. Well, right? And, and, and so there was a lot of soul searching. Um, but people were, were, were truly distraught. Uh, with grief after the fire. Uh, on, there were funeral processions for days and days and days and days. Um, and um, fraternal organizations uh, helped to cover the cost of the burials. Um, for example, one of the things we talked about on the walk today was um, mutual support, uh, mutual, um, mutual aid societies. So the Workmen's Circle, for example, provided burial plots um, for families that couldn't afford their own. And these crossed ethnic lines. Even the Italians who could not afford burial plots were given free burial plots um, by the Workmen's Circle. I mean, these were families that were so poor they didn't have the money to, to bury their dead. So the funerals just, sometimes people would end up behind the wrong funeral cortege because there were just so many of them. A funeral would turn a corner, and people would find they were actually marching in, in the funeral procession for somebody else. It was, it was difficult to keep track uh, for a while. On April 5, 1911, there was a final funeral procession for the unidentified dead. Um, the Garment Union, the ILGWU, organized more than 100,000 workers. And again, um, as Ellen Todd has written about this, the, it was the women who really got it together to do this. They got, what should we do? What should we do? And the women said, we're doing a funeral procession. We're doing it. And uh, they organized, um, and 100,000 um, workers marched um, with union banners um, <coughs> for three hours in the pouring rain. 
Uh, 400,000 spectators stood by bearing witness silently. So you're looking at, you know, half a million people in the pouring rain for hours in New York City. It was, it was one, it, people who participated in it or witnessed it never forgot it. Um, it was really uh, heart-wrenching. Um, and these are some of the banners. Uh, you can see um, the, 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 the banners that, that they carried. Um, the ILGWU and uh, other labor organizations formed a joint relief committee to provide funds for the families. They raised $30,000. I mean, some families never got any money because they didn't know it was available. Other families got, didn't get any money because they were too ashamed to ask for it. Um, but, but the union did raise uh, $30,000. Um, many immigrant families lived precariously to begin with, and they lost wage earners and family members. I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. Um, the Rosens. Israel Rosen and his son, uh, Julia, worked together. They both died in the fire. Israel was 17. Julia, I believe, was 35 or 36. Um, so that family lost mother and son. Uh, for the 100th uh, anniversary of the fire, the coalition, we have made, we have handmade shirtwaists with the names of all the victims, uh, sashes with the names of all the victims. For the anniversary of the fire, um, my son and I carried Israel. I always get emotional when I think about this. My son was 17 at the time, um, and he carried Israel's uh, shirtwaist, and I carried Julia Rosen's uh, shirtwaist. Um, the Maltese family, I told you about the, the girl who was 14 years old, Rosaria Maltese. The Maltese family lost all of its women. There were three boys and three girls, and the three girls, mother and two daughters, died in the fire that day. The family was cut in half. There were no women left. The dad was uh, forced to raise his sons. Uh, they had lost a child previously, um, and all the women were, were taken out of their family that day. The Wiener family had sisters. There were several families that had sisters, uh, Katie and Rosie Wiener. Katie survived the fire. Rosie died. Katie and Rosie's great uh, niece, Elizabeth um, Suzanne Pred Bass, is a, a member of the Triangle Coalition. She's on the board, um, and she thinks about you know how hard it must have been for Katie, the older one, to leave. She must have been looking for her sister that day, right? Um, and and the, the 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 brother of the family. If you've heard the story about the trial, which we'll talk about in a minute, when somebody yells "murderers, murderers," um, at Blank and Harris, that was the brother of Rosie and Katie Wiener. Um, uh, so there were funeral processions, uh, also out of respect for the dead. The May Day procession went past Triangle uh, that year, and for years after that, and they marched silently past the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. It became this, this almost um, like a, a, a sacred space, and it remains that way till today, and, and we'll talk about that. So the first reaction was grief. The second reaction was resolve. Um, there was a spike in union organizing after the fire. Uh, there were, there were um, strikes, there was increased agitation, and there was a spike in organizing. So resolve came from the workers themselves. They became doubly and triply attentive to the issue of worker safety, um, to advocacy, to organizing, to educating, to, to you know, spreading the, the news about the, the history of what had happened at Triangle, and they remained diligent. Um, <clears throat> the other resolve came from government entities. Um, the New York State Factory Investigating Committee was formed after the fire. It was headed by Senator Robert E. Wagner and Alfred Smith, as well as uh, Samuel Gompers, the president of the American Federation of Labor, was also instrumental. Um, the chief investigator was a, a young social worker uh, named, who you may have heard of, Francis Perkins. Um, Perkins was having tea in an apartment just off uh, Washington Square Park when the commotion, you know, there was the commotion and, and they ran outside and Perkins was an eyewitness of the fire. Um, another eyewitness of the fire who was considerably less well known but was at, you know, in different ways, equally important, I would argue as well, maybe it was a very important person, was Mary Heaton Vorse, um, who went on to become a really important labor reporter. Uh, Mary Heaton Vorse um, was instrumental in publicizing the Bread and Roses strike a year later in Lawrence. She witnessed the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. She came from a very upscale family in New England and was transformed by the fire as well and steeled her commitment to become a labor journalist. Um, Frances Perkins was the chief investigator. She was inspired by Roche Schneiderman. So in, after the fire, there was a meeting 
um, and Roche Snyderman spoke eloquently about the need to organize, about respon taking responsibility for the fire. And Perkins, who herself went to go on, we'll talk about this in a minute, to do all these wonderful things, was inspired by a union organizer. So it's important um, to give credit to government entities and agencies, um, but also the pressure. Um, was mounted by the labor movement. Something has to be done. So it wasn't just guilty middle class people, but it was an active, vigilant labor movement um, that inspired and agitated. Um, so the New York City, uh, New York City created the Bureau of Fire Prevention and put it under the purview of the New York uh, Fire Department. New York State passed laws requiring automatic sprinklers, stricter requirements for fire escapes, fire alarms, and fire drills in factories. In fact, in 1913, 1914, three years later, um, New York City held its first citywide commemoration of the Triangle Fire. They called it Triangle Day, and there were fire drills at schools and factories all over the city, from the Bronx to Brooklyn. Um, and in fact, apparently what would happen is they'd have all these fire drills in locations and there'd be like a party in the streets because kids would be, ah, it's a fire drill and workers would be out and there was a festive atmosphere. But nonetheless, it demonstrates the commitment. I mean, this really took on uh, a significance um, um, much greater than a half an hour um, worth of time would suggest. Um, there were standards set for proper ventilation and lighting, elevator operation and sanitation, and there were additional laws to protect women and children on the job. Um, New York State, essentially New York City and New York State, because of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, led the nation in worker safety um, after the fire. I mean, the, the, the committee spent years visiting sites. Perkins was diligent in visiting way more sites than the, was initially um, suggested, and they, they came up with a host of recommendations. Uh, the de power of the New York State Department of Labor was increased. There were more inspectors hired so that the uh, department could monitor workplaces more closely and more easily pass laws to protect workers from mistreatment on the job. In 1915 and 1916, the building code was revised to establish maximum occupancy limits for buildings based on the number and availability of emergency exits. Anytime you're in a building and you see an exit sign, think triangle. Anytime you're in a building and you see a fire extinguisher, think triangle. Anytime you're in a building and the doors open outwards so that if there's a fire, you don't have to remember to push back, think triangle. And Fraser and I were walking into the Levi's building. I wanted to buy jeans today. And I kept pulling. And he said, push, push, remember. No, I kept pushing. And he said, pull, pull, remember they open outward because of triangle. And I thought, right, OK. So it's, it's hard to underestimate how much of your life and my life is safer because 146 workers died on March 25, 1911. The long-term repercussions, all right. Um, Frances Perkins was forever changed by the fire. Um, she went on to become an ally of Al Smith, who became governor of New York State, and uh, four times between 1919 and 1929. And he was the most progressive governor of his era, um, particularly with regard to uh, worker rights and worker safety legislation. And, and uh, that was due to his experience uh, with the Triangle and Francis Perkins, um, their alliance. Perkins, as you know, goes on to become the first female cabinet secretary. Um, and she is the driving engine behind, she's the Secretary of Labor, she is the driving engine behind the progressive labor policies of uh, the FDR administrations. And she is quoted, this is, this is, I believe, a verbatim quote, as saying that the New Deal began on March 25th, 1911. So for Perkins, there was a direct line between the things she was doing with the New Deal and what she witnessed in New York City during the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. So what about Blank and Harris? On April 11th, the grand jury indicted the two men on seven counts, charging them with manslaughter in the second degree under Section 80 of the Labor Code, which mandated that doors should not be locked during work hours. The doors were locked. I don't remember if I said this, but the doors, according to the testimony of survivors, we don't know how many people survived because the records were burned. That's one of the things the coalition is doing. We're you know, taking, collecting names and you know, allying with the survivors because their lives were forever um, touched by this fire. I mean, 
talk about PTSD, right? If you witness or experience this fire. Um, we don't know how many survivors there were, but the survivors who testified at the trial testified, Katie Weiner was one of them, that the doors were locked. That was disputed by Max Stoyer, the, uh, the lawyer for Blank and Harris. Um, he, he argued that they, their testimony was too similar. They must have been coached. Um, but they insisted that the doors were locked. And so that was the issue. Did Blank and Harris know that the doors were locked? And why would they have been locked? Well, one, was, one reason would have been to keep theft uh, to a minimum. In fact, there was almost no theft. It was negligible. But, there, but doors, when they were locked, were lock, locked to keep girls from stealing things. Uh, another reason was to keep girls from taking too many breaks, cigarette breaks, bathroom breaks, going outside. Um, and the third, of course, was to keep out the union organizers, right? As the ILG was making inroads, um, Triangle resisted, they locked out the union organizers. Um, but the jury found when, in their deliberations that it was not proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Blank and Harris knew the doors were locked. And so they were found not guilty. December 27th, 23 days after the trial started, the jury acquitted Blank and Harris. Um, and there was you know, a great wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's when uh, Wiener yelled out, murderers, murderers, you have blood on your hands, right? People were astounded. Um, so 23 individual civil suits were brought against the two men. Um, they uh, settled on March 11th, 1914, so not a couple years later, three years later. Uh, and they paid $75 per life lost. They made more money in insurance than they paid to the families of the victims. They actually made money on the fire. That's a, that's a true fact. They made a profit. Uh, they went on to open more factories, and they continued to be charged with endangering lives, locked doors, et cetera, et cetera. But there are stories of heroism as well as villainy. Um, I encourage you to look at the Kiel Center site. Um, one of them is the elevator uh, boy, uh, Joey Zito. Joe Zito uh, took, took down uh, a bunch of, of workers, and who could blame him if he took off? But he didn't. Um, he went back in the elevator, and he kept going up and coming down until the cable broke and he couldn't go anymore. He, until fairly recently, was buried in an unmarked grave. His heroism was completely um, unmarked. Um, his family is terrific. Uh, what a great family story. I would, love, uh, I would love to have that kind of heroism in my family. So this is not a story where, where, you know, with victims and villains only, right? There was a lot of heroism here. Um, the building still stands. This is the building today. It's the Brown Building, right? It was, it was um, bought and then re-renovated re um, after the fire and then donated to NYU. Um, what are the streets? This is... Uh, Washington and Green. Okay. Yeah, Washington Place and Green Street. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a block east of Washington Square Park. You can't, you, you, now you can miss it, but if you ask people, they'll, they'll help you find it. It's at the corner of Washington Place and Green Street. Uh, so we're working uh, to build a permanent memorial on the building at the site of the fire. People, you can see plaques here, right? There's a plaque, it's landmarked. There's a plaque that the ILG put up there in 1961. Um, and then there's another plaque um, that just gives a little bit of the history. But you can walk right past it. And we've been, Fraser and I have been in the city he, on the block when people have said, where's the Triangle Building? A lot of people think um, it's the Flatiron Building because it looks kind of, in fact, we were at dinner with somebody last night who said, oh, that's that building. And no, it's not shaped like a triangle. It is where the Triangle Factory was. Um, people walk past it all the time. And so we want to change that. Um, so the, the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition is uh, looking to build a permanent memorial on the site of the fire. In 2012, we did what, what everyone had failed to do for 101 years. We signed an agreement with, well, a little bit less than that, fewer than that. We signed an agreement with NYU which said, uh, we will let you put a memorial on our building. It's an interesting project. It'll be a public memorial, but it's a privately owned building. And so we, they have allowed us um, the, the, the right to install a memorial on the building. In 2013, we held an international design competition. We got 176 entries from over 30 countries. And the first prize entry, and this is it right here, was a team of designers from Queens, New York. 
borough of my birth, believe it or not. So we searched the world over, and we found designers from one of the boroughs of New York City. Uh, it was a, a refereed competition. We had labor historians. We had architects. Um, we had fashion designers. We had public artists. Blind review, and this is the design that they chose in, in collaboration with NYU and the Landmarks uh, uh, Commission, because it is a landmarked building. It's called Reframing the Sky. And, and here's how it works. So, so down here, right, down here will be uh, polished steel 16-inch um, uh, panel, vertical panel, slightly angled. And then up here, I forget how many feet high, I think that's 16 feet. This part of the building is new. It's, it's from the 70s. This, the rest of it is all as it was in 1911. The panels meet at the corner of Washington and Green. The lower panels, the upper panels meet at the corner of Washington and Green, and then they go up to the ninth, eighth floor where the fire happened, as you can see. So here's what happened. You walk past the lower panel, and you see names reflected because they're carved into, if you see where I'm pointing over there, they're carved into the upper panel, right? Um, right here, the names are, are carved so that light flows through this panel and then is reflected off this polished panel and it looks like that. So you can see, you know, the name of Vincenzo Pinelli, uh, Celia Gitlin. And what happens is you walk past, you look down and you see the names reflected, or you look up and you see the names reflected. But when you look down, you see the names reflected, you see the sky, and when you look to get a better look, you see yourself. So it draws you into the, uh, the experience, um, and you have, you're looking up and you're looking down as you would have been on March 25th. The panels that go up the side of the building do two things. They give the memorial scale. So you can, you know, when you're, when you're a bit of a distance away, you say, oh, what's that? And then you walk over and then you engage up close, right? So it allows for long distance and up close engagement. But if you remember the, the image I showed you, and here it is, the, at the beginning, the signage that was on the side of the building in 1911, they evoke that kind of historical signage that would have been hanging off the corner of the building in 1911. So what this project does from an architectural and public history point of view is really interesting is it amplifies the message of the building, right? The Triangle Building is a neo-Renaissance building, the Brown Building. It's a neo-Renaissance building. It's nothing special architecturally. Um, there are several buildings in New York like it. The building is not landmarked for architectural reasons. It's landmarked because something really important happened there. And so what the Memorial Project does is it enables the building to speak eloquently on, on days when we are not gathered. At the, and that's where we commemorate, at that corner, right, every year. When we're not gathered at that corner, um, when you know, we're not doing talks somewhere about this, when there aren't school trips to the building. So it speaks eloquently, the building, all the time every day, and our hope is that it will become a destination memorial, and I strongly suspect that it will. The Triangle site, um, I, in my experience with my research, this is perhaps the most important site-specific, one of the most important site-specific places of labor history in the world. Um, when, when Bangladeshi labor organizers come to testify at the UN, they come to the Triangle Building. When Laura Boldrini, who's the president of the Italian, uh, uh, the lower house of parliament of, the, of Italy, came to the US, she came to the Triangle Building. When families from New Orleans come to the city and they want to, you know, they know something important happened with the Triangle Fire, they have ancestors who work, they come to the Triangle Building, right? Um, I don't know that there's a site that attracts that much pilgrimage outside perhaps of the Communards Wall in Paris, globally. Um, we were just in Italy this summer and when, when, when I <coughs> tell people about this project, Immediately, they know, right? Uh, the Triangle Fire inspired uh, International Women's Day. It was already in, in the works, but the Triangle Fire really pushed it forward. Um, and so in Italy, their International Women's Day is March 8th. In Italy, lots of people think the fire actually happened on March 8th because the two are so connected. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an event of global significance, um, and the site draws people from all over the world. So we want it to speak um, eloquently. In December of 2015, Andrew Cuomo, who's not necessarily on the right side of things all the time. He's on the right side of this. He announced his intention to fund the capital budget for the memorial fully to the tune of $1.5 million. Uh, we're now raising the money to endow, to clean it, to maintain it in perpetuity. There's nothing sadder than a, than a fractured memorial. And to endow a labor uh, studies uh, scholarship. 
um, for, for students who want to study uh, labor history, who have an interest in, in labor history. So why? You know, sometimes I lay awake at night, no joke, saying, why am I doing this? There's so many things I could do with a million and a half dollars, right? Okay, why? Well, first we want to honor the dead and the survivors. Uh, almost what we're going to do, we're going to tell the story of the fire on this part of the panel. Probably um, Frances Perkins' uh, testimony about what she witnessed, um, her, her remembrance of her eyewitness experience, which she gave um, on, at the 50th anniversary. So we want to tell the story. We want to honor the dead with their names. We want to tell the story and remember the social justice movement that emerged afterwards, right? But we also want to claim space for women. Um, there are 150 historical statues in Manhattan, 400 years of civic history. Five are women. So in 400 years of history, 150 statues of real people who had, who had you know, real historical markers, five reference women. Joan of Arc, Gertrude Stein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Golda Meir, and Harriet Tubman. We want to change that. Um, we believe there is a connection between the architectural presence or absence of women and their social, economic, and political status um, at large. The other thing we want to do is acknowledge immigrant workers past and present, our ancestors, and our neighbors, their role in creating the society we live in, both materially and politically. Um, and we have occupancy limits, fire extinguishers, outward opening doors because of the deaths of immigrant women. We want to mark that. And we want to inspire activism. We want to inspire the future Clara Lemlicks, Mary Heaton Vorses, and Frances Perkins of the world. And we want to express solidarity with contemporary workers here and around the world. At the commemoration every year, we have workers from Haiti. We have workers from Bangladesh. We have workers from El Salvador. Um, we have workers from around the US, right? Um, and we want to continue to inspire global solidarity. So as you know, the labor movement's in transition. There's a lot of work that remains to be done. The fight for 15, we need a living wage. Um, Verizon, we need to keep jobs in the US. Um, and garment manufacturing is no longer as prominent in New York or in the US as it once was. Still, there are awful working conditions in the industry where it does exist. And much of the, the, the problems of garment work, we have exported along with the work itself. Um, and there are organizations doing good work. Uh, on this front, the International Labor Rights Forum, a human rights organization that advocates <coughs> for workers globally. They have the Clean Clothes Campaign, which you may have heard of. Um, you might want to look into it. If you haven't, founded in 1989, it's an alliance of 16 organizations in Europe to advocate for better working conditions in the global garment industry. Their efforts are desperately needed. November 24th, 2011, fire at Tazreen factory. Um, in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, left over 100 people dead. It was eerily similar to Triangle. April 24th, 2013, also in Bangladesh, the Rana Plaza factory collapsed, um, killing 1,130 garment workers. 2,500 people rescued alive. Uh, some suffered terrible injuries. Bangladesh is the world's second leading uh, exporter of clothing, trailing only China. Has more than 5,000 garment factories handling orders for nearly all of the world's top brands and retailers. Look at your garment labels. I'm sure somebody in this room has clothes made in Bangladesh, and they have the lowest wages in the world for factory workers. But garment manufacturing is far from the only dangerous work. Um, in 2014, OSHA statistics, 4,821 workers killed on the job. 3.4 workers per 100,000 full-time equivalent workers. On average, more than 92 workers a week were killed in 2014. More than 13 deaths a day. Okay, so I don't know how many people are in this room. This is half of you, right, would be dead. Um, on a typical day in 2014. 804 Hispanic or Latino workers were killed from work-related injuries. On average, more than 15 deaths a week for that group. Two Latino workers killed every single day of the year, all year long. And if work doesn't kill you immediately, it might kill you slowly. I come from a family of coal miners. Mining is one of the most dangerous industries, and the deaths are not always immediate. I lost an uncle in a mining disaster. but. As you, you, many of you may know, the long-term effects of mining are no less treacherous. Uh, black lung disease is perhaps the most well-known uh, disease associated with coal mining. In 2014, black lung disease was reported at being its highest in 40 years. 
And in 2014 and 2016, phases one and two of the Mine Safety Health Administration's respirable dust rule was put into effect. This is a rule that maintains inspections, treatment, masks, you know, purifiers for the air. But miners got this law because they fought for it. In 1969, they struck to get the disease recognized as a job hazard. It was not recognized as a job hazard until 1969, and it's because coal miners said, we're out of here until you recognize that this is a hazard of the job. And more recently, they struck or threatened to strike to get the dust rule passed. So none of this stuff just happens, right? Um, the coalition is an ally for these organizations. Cecil Roberts, president of the United Mine Workers, spoke at the Centennial. He was fabulous about the need to organize. Um, and our, our slogan for the past several years has been, we are all workers. The coalition supports the work of the United Mine Workers. We support the work of the International Labor Rights Forum. We support the work of Bangladeshi union organizers. Um, we publicize actions and events on our website. Um, we remember, we organize, we are all workers. This is our slogan. This is the um, poster from this year's commemoration. So our hope is that the, the work that we do, talks like this, uh, marching with shirtwaists and the Labor Day Parade and the memorial uh, will inspire more activism of the sort uh, that we talked about here. Um, people from around the world come to the site. Um, people from around the world need to join together uh, to fight for workers' rights uh, and worker safety because that fight is never over. And I would end um, with a, um, an expression since we had the Italian American walking tour today. The, 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 the Italian for this is la lotta continua, the struggle continues. And indeed it does. Thank you very much. Questions? The ladies refers to the garments. Uh -huh. So they made oh, shirt waist. The garments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they didn't just, I mean, the, need, the, the garment workers in New York didn't just make ladies clothing. Uh -huh. But I think, I, I want to say, I had the statistic and I forgot to bring it with me. Like, I want to say like 75%, but don't quote me on this. Like, some really high percentage of women's clothing was made in New York at the time. And, and so this would have referred to the clothing itself. Um, there was a high proportion of women in that industry, but there also were, I mean, there were, there were guys in the industry as well, and indeed, most of the leaders of the unions were guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. It was wonderful listening to, uh, to you about the fire. I'm, I have a two-part question. What are floors 8, 9, and 10 today? And why didn't the the next work? I'll answer the second question first, and then the first part of the question, I have goosebumps, and we looked at each other, you'll understand in a minute. The next, because, you know, you're 110 pounds of human flesh falling nine floors into a net that was not designed to catch 110 pounds falling from the ninth floor. Gravity, momentum, it, they just split apart. And, and the sad part is, the cop, I mean, the firemen were just, they were devastated. Uh, the fire chief, uh, Croker, um, who, who then moved to my hometown afterwards, uh, so I have this sort of karmic connection with Triangle everywhere I go, but he, um, he had predicted that something terrible like this was going to happen and was absolutely devastated and was one of the most eloquent spokesperson for fire safety at the hearings that happened um, afterward. Um, but it was, it was just, there was just, this was unprecedented that you would be trying to catch bodies this heavy with this kind of material, you just, and you can't hold, I mean, it just gets ripped out of your hand. You just can't do it. It's too high up. Um, the second part. So you notice when I showed the, the slide of the ladder and you, you're looking up. So when we commemorate the fire, what we do, um, I've actually even written about this. We stand outside and we look up and we position ourselves the way spectators and witnesses did on March 25th, 1911. So we are not empathizing so much with the workers when we do this as the, the witnesses. So I become Frances Perkins, I become Mary Heaton Vorse, I become William Gunn Shepherd, and I'm 
this can never happen again, right? What I'm witnessing is, is steals my determination, and that's a great thing. When you go inside the building, which is now laboratories, um, science laboratories and classrooms for NYU, it's a completely different experience. You would think that because it's classrooms, it's, oh, all right, you know, sort of the, the feel for the history is diminished, but it's not. I mean, Fraser can attest to this. Uh, for the centennial, and then again this year, the coalition um, worked with NYU to lead tours of the building for family members and a few guests. We couldn't open it up to the public. And uh, we brought people up to the ninth floor. You get off the elevator, you walk past rows and rows of laboratory uh, tables with NYU graduate students poring diligently over their work, and you, it's eerily reminiscent of, I'm not saying they're exploited, I don't know, I'm not a graduate student at NYU, but, but you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is kind of what it might have looked like to have garment workers poring over their work, they're packed in. But then you go to the, ta to the, to the corner, the, you know, right here, right? And you look out the window, and you're, you can't imagine what it feels like. I mean, I don't know, Fraser, you, can you describe what it, what it feels like when you look out the window? It's, uh, it's, it's wow. very high. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the ledge is, the ledge is, uh, yeah. so it's, it's really, really. And you, you think, oh my gosh, they jumped. There's, they knew they were jumping to their deaths. They just did not want, I mean, the choice between burning alive, even though you, usually you don't, and, and, and jumping to your death, the, jumping to your death was a preferable alternative. Some of them held hands. And, and it, Martin Abramowitz was with us, the father, the, the son, not the grandson, but the son of the cutter. He broke down weeping. I mean, he had to be consoled. He, and, and people did. You just, you find yourself tearing up because you think this is the last thing they saw before they jumped. And this was preferable to staying in the building. So you know how awful it was. David? Did you say that there was a sprinkler system, but the water didn't get there? No, there, was, there were buckets, and there was a hose. Just buckets? Because I thought you said something about the water not getting up. The ho yeah, no. Oh, well, they did. When they hosed it from the fire yeah, trucks. The fire they, right, okay. yeah. Yeah, and you could see in the, in the photos, you see the fire, the, the water going up. Right, yeah. There's a really poignant story. Um, it's in Leon Stein's book, too. The croaker, after, um, when he went to go through the rubble, he found a mouse, and it was alive, and he stuck it in his pocket, and he said, it's alive. It's the only living thing, and he took it and rescued it out of the building. It was just, there was just that much destruction. But there was water. I mean, there was water that got up there, just not... Yep. Not what they needed. Not what they needed, when they needed it. And how much of commemoration, and I think they have a... They say the names of everyone yep. who died and, and a bell rings and they yep. you put a flower down. And also, I'm not sure what's happening with NYU now, but for a while, I think it was the graduate students or the teaching assistants who were trying to organize and NYU wasn't very good about it. The, NYU organized, they, they were organized under the United Auto Workers. Mm -hmm. So graduate students, it's interesting. The ones at Stony Brook are organized under the Communication Workers of America, NYU organized under the UAW. We do, we lay a flower down um, for the victims of the triangle. We say their names. We usually have school kids do it. Um, and the relatives, and, and, and we've done it before. And then we lay flowers like after, um, after every year after we do the triangle names, we lay flowers for um, people who've died in, in a workplace um, uh, accidents or on, on the job that year. I also heard that uh, you've done research, or somebody's done research on where everybody lived, mm -hmm. and now there's like a plaque or something that. Um, the, the woman who founded the coalition, Ruth Sergal, it, it, it started a project in 2008 called Chalk. So every year on the anniversary of the fire, um, people fan throughout the city and chalk the names of the victims in front of where they lived and note that they died at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. It's a really moving experience. I've done it with students. I've done it myself. So all over. Um, and in fact, there's a woman who teaches at Berkeley City College, Laura Roberto, who did a chalk project here in, in San Francisco. There have been chalk projects elsewhere um, to remember uh, triangle victims on that day. And then it washes away, and then we do it again next year. 